In the 1952 presidential election, the Republican candidate was Eisenhower. The Democratic candidate was Adlai Stevenson. The outgoing incumbent president before that presidential election was, of course, Harry Truman. Three days before the presidential election of 1952, President Harry Truman decided to bequeath to his successor something absolutely terrifying that the world had never seen before and that the new president, whoever he was going to be, uh, had no idea was even possible. And where Harry Truman decided to conjure this little gift was here. I head southwest from the continental United States. You hit Hawaii, you keep heading southwest, keep going, keep going, keep going. When you're about halfway to Australia, what you come to out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean is Micronesia, specifically the Marshall Islands. The Marshall Islands uh, is a country that is made up of 1,156 separate islands. Up until three days before the 1952 U.S. presidential election, though, the Marshall Islands actually had one more island than that. Because three days before the 1952 presidential election, President Harry Truman gave the order that resulted in one of the islands of the Marshall Islands being vaporized. They completely destroyed that island, literally wiped it off the face of the map with one bomb, a bomb that was bigger than any bomb that had ever been set off before on Earth, bigger than any other bomb on Earth by a huge margin. And that bomb's name was Mike. Mike. Mike? The bombs that had been set off seven years earlier at the end of World War II in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, those bombs uh, were named Fat Man and Little Boy. Those were atomic bombs. One of them used uranium, one of them used plutonium. When those bombs were set off in 1945, they were almost unimaginably huge. The bomb at Hiroshima was the equivalent of 15,000 tons of TNT. The bomb at, a few days later at Nagasaki was even bigger. It was the equivalent of 21,000 tons of TNT. Well, the bomb that Truman set off in the Marshall Islands seven years later in 1952, that bomb named Mike, that wasn't the equivalent of a few thousand tons of TNT or even a few tens of thousands of tons of TNT. Mike, that bomb that vaporized one of the Marshall Islands in 1952, it was the equivalent of 10 million tons of TNT. 10 million tons. It was a qualitatively different animal. When they set off that bomb, that bomb named Mike in 1952 in the Marshall Islands, the fireball from that single bomb reached a height of nearly 60,000 feet. For context, the typical cruising altitude for a commercial airliner is about 30,000 feet. Just the fireball from just that one bomb was double that height. The mushroom cloud that this one bomb created was 100 miles wide. Every nuclear bomb is obviously a big deal, but some are a bigger deal than others. In the early 1950s, starting with that first explosion in the Marshall Islands, the United States graduated from the nuclear bombs, like the ones we had dropped on Japan, that were fission bombs. They created explosions by splitting atoms. We graduated that day in 1952 to fusion bombs. Bombs that were at least a thousand times more powerful than the kinds of nuclear bombs we'd had before. Fusion bombs worked not by splitting atoms, but by fusing atoms together. They are much, much, much more powerful. They are much harder to make. But once you have mastered how to make them, here's one of the reasons they are much, much more scary. Not just because they can be so much more powerful. It's because once you know how to make a hydrogen bomb, a fusion bomb, one of these second generation nukes, they can be manufactured pretty small. They can be made as pretty fair, fairly small physical devices. And that means strategically that they don't have to be bombs the size of you know, small houses that get pushed out of huge slow moving airplanes. They can be fairly small devices that can be packed onto missiles and shot all the way across the world. North Korea set off its first nuclear explosion during the George W. Bush administration in 2006. They set off another one in 2009. They set off another one in 2013. They have built nuclear bombs. They have caused nuclear explosions. But the bombs they have built have not been particularly good ones, and the explosions they've set off have not been particularly big ones. All three of their nuclear explosions thus far were thought to be the product of fission bombs, the old school kind, the kind that the U.S. dropped on Japan in 1945. Last month, though, the ferocious little dictator who inherited North Korea from his dad 
he started bragging publicly that under him, North Korea was ready to set off not just an old school nuclear bomb like they'd done before, but the new kind, a hydrogen bomb, a thermonuclear device, a bomb that uses not fission, but fusion. And last night we reported this breaking news of a seismic event of some kind that had been detected at a North Korean nuclear site. South Korea said immediately that they thought it was another nuclear test. North Korea said within a matter of hours that, oh yeah, not only was it a nuclear test, they said it was a nuclear test of a fusion bomb, of the giant kind of nuclear bomb, the kind that wiped that island off the map in 1952. If that is what they did, then North Korea has not only developed a much, much more powerful nuclear bomb than they ever did before, they have developed the type of nuclear bomb that could be miniaturized and put on a missile and sent somewhere very far flung around the globe. That's the bad news about what North Korea is claiming it did when it caused that earthquake last night. That's the bad news. The good news is that the people who really understand these things are utterly convinced that North Korea is lying about it. Joining us now is a real expert in the field who knows how to talk to those of us who aren't. Uh, my friend Joe Serencioni, president of the Plowshares Fund. Joe, it's great to see you. Thank you for being here. My pleasure, Rachel. First of all, let me ask you in my traditional way if yeah. I explained that right in terms of the different kinds of nuclear weapons we're talking about here. That, that was exactly right, and I've been trying to make this point all day. People have lost, lost touch with how powerful these hydrogen bombs are. These are the weapons we have, enormously destructive devices. Most Americans don't understand what the difference is between an atomic and a hydrogen bomb. You just demonstrated it perfectly. Okay. Do you believe that North Korea is lying when they say they set off a hydrogen bomb? Yes. I, I believe they are, they are exaggerating their their capabilities i believe they're exaggerating the the device kim jong un is the donald trump of of north korea he makes outlandish statements but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're true mm. then we can tell that from the seismic signal that we're picking up thanks to the international monitoring system we have set up from the comprehensive test ban treaty organization we can measure the the, the earthquake that was generated by this blast, and we can make an estimate of its yield of the device, which clocks in at something like 6,000 tons. Okay. That's a pretty big explosion, but it's nothing like you would expect from a hydrogen bomb, and, and even a failed hydrogen bomb would come in at 10, 20, 50,000 tons of explosive force. That's why most of us think this is not a true hydrogen bomb. Let me just stop you there and just restate that for clarity so I make sure I get the scale here, because sometimes with big numbers, it's hard to it's hard to keep in mind their scale, but if, if say, Hiroshima, that bomb was about 15,000 yes. tons of TNT, this was 6,000 tons of TNT, so not even half that size. If it right. had been a hydrogen bomb, it would be hundreds, if not a thousand times bigger than Hiroshima, not half the size. <laughs> Exactly. The hydrogen bombs we have on our Minuteman missile, for example, are 300, 400,000 tons of TNT. Even mm. in a test, a scaled down test, you would expect a much bigger, bigger uh, signature, and we didn't get that. That's why you heard the White House come out today and say the data so far is inconsistent with the claim that this is a hydrogen bomb. Even if this wasn't a hydrogen bomb, Joe, is there reason to believe that they are moving toward that capability? That is the really bad, the good news there is that they didn't do it. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it, whatever they were trying to do, it probably didn't succeed. This was actually a little smaller than the test they had in 2013. The bad news is just they're trying. Yeah. This is their fourth test. And even in a failed test, you learn something from your, your, your mistakes. So the, the lesson here for us is if we leave them alone, if we just continue doing nothing and don't engage North Korea and don't do something different from what we're doing, these guys that one day are going to get a hydrogen bomb. And that's what sends shockwaves around the world today. Even for the 12 or, or 20 hours where we thought they might have a hydrogen bomb, people were freaked. That, that North Korea might have a weapon, two or three of which could destroy South Co Korea, two or three of which could destroy central Japan. That's the fear that that test set. That's why the UN Security Council is meeting an emergency session tomorrow. That's why. And so and now the fear is not that they have those weapons, but they're aiming at it, uh, which is also cause for real fear, but a different kind. Joe Serencioni, president of the Plowshares Fund, clear uh, and direct as always. Joe, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Rachel. All right, we'll be right back. Stay with us.
Hey YouTube fans, I'm Luke Russert. Thanks for checking out our MSNBC channel. Subscribe by clicking right here and click any of the videos over here to watch the latest breaking news, mini documentaries, conversations from Shift, and other digital exclusives. Check it out.